Okay, let's move on with some other uh, bacterial cell structures. Um, first one, again, this stuff found in many, but not all. Okay, so we went over the cell wall, now we can talk about glycocalyx. So, glycocalyx is the layer outside of the bacterial cell, outside of the membrane, uh, outside of the wall, outside of the outer membrane. It consists of, um, you know, a lot of carbohydrates and proteoglycans. And there are two types to it. Um, so, first type of glycocalyx is capsule. It's a really important uh, feature. It's pretty rigid. Okay, it protects against phagocytosis and increases adhesion to the surfaces. And second structure is slime layer, which is kind of loose. It does not protect much, but it increases surface adhesion. Now, I want to use this opportunity to introduce two concepts. I'm going to throw terms at you, okay? We're going to come back and we, we it, it's often hard to define a specific concept, like formally define. So the first concept in microbiology, the concept of virulence factors. So what is the virulence factor? Virulence factor is any phenotypical feature. And that's important, any phenotypical feature that increases or has a potential to increase the severity of the disease. Does that make sense? So now think about this too. Capsule, first of all, it protects against phagocytosis, which means it allows bacterial cells to escape your immune system. If bacterial cells escape your immune system, does it make the disease more severe, potentially? It does. So this is the virulence factor, okay? Slime layer, if adhesion to the surface of the cells in your body increases, does it potentially make bacteria more, you know, causing more severe disease? Yes, it does. Slime layer is a virulence factor. If bacteria are resistant to antibiotics, it's a virulence factor. Does that make sense? So virulence factor, anything that can potentially increase the severity of the disease, right? Another concept that I'm going to throw at you, we're going to talk about this in Unit 3, it's the concept of biofilm. So both of these, since they increase adhesion, both slime layer and capsule, they facilitate the formation of biofilms. Okay? Most bacteria grow on the surface, not, not in the solution. They grow in the form of biofilms. So biofilms are of the incredible importance for clinicians, um, surface of the prosthetic joints, surface of the um, catheters, surface of the uh, tubes that are used for mechanical ventilation, all of them can be covered with bacterial biofilms. Biofilms are ridiculously hard to remove. They're very resistant to desiccation, to antibiotics, to predation. So it's a huge clinical problem. That makes sense? Good? Okay. Uh, now, last thing um, to talk about bacterial cells before we move to actual bacteria, to our couple of our first pathogens, okay, is Jesus. Not Jesus. No. We're not talking about Jesus here. Uh, we're going to talk about external appendages. So what there are three uh, types of external appendages that I want you to know. Uh, first of them is going to be fimbriae that increase adhesion to the surfaces. Next one will be pili, which allow bacteria to transfer genetic information between the cells.
also, in some cases, can increase adhesion. And finally, um, the jello. So we're going to spend some time on okay, uh, what will jello look like. Obviously, it's the bandage that is used for movement. Now let's take a let's take a brief look at the structure of the flagellum. I'm going to put it right here so everybody can see it. Okay, same color. So you have some kind of a mortar. Okay, this is just just the loose rendition of a mortar, whatever it is. In the center of the mortar is a rod. Okay. Here you have. A hook, and from a hook, the filament extends. So now check this out. This molecular motor moves the rod. Okay, that's the rod. Okay, when rod moves, hook moves. And when the hook moves, flagellum moves. You see, so flagellum works like a propeller. Okay, that's the feature of bacterial flagella. Now, uh, this is one thing that I don't really care about the differences between gram positive and gram negative flagellar structures, it's just this basic stuff. Now, what provides energy for flagellar rotation? If you say ATP, you're right, but it's a little bit more complicated. So, next kind of a part of a motor is a channel for hydrogens, okay? So hydrogens will diffuse via that channel, okay? That makes sense. So this is your hydrogen ions diffusing via the channel. Diffusion is the movement of ions, are you following me? Every movement implies kinetic energy. So when this hydrogen ions diffuse, the kinetic energy that is released as the result of this diffusion rotates the flagellum. Does that make sense? We clear? Now, obvious question here. What creates the gradient of hydrogen ions? Turns out there is a special protein here, which is basically a hydrogen pump. Okay, and it pumps hydrogen on hydrogens on this side. And this this protein it does require ATP. Okay. Now you can look at it and say, hold on, this is very inefficient. This is a great example. Nature is not about efficiency. Nature about whatever works. Now if you look at this, you know hydrogens are being pumped on one side of the membrane, and then they diffuse through some kind of a channel, and that diffusion, that kinetic energy of that diffusion generates energy. If it looks eerily familiar to you, it should, because it reminds a lot what happens during ATP synthesis, okay? And turns out, these molecules here, they share a lot of similarities, like structural similarities, where the ATP, this molecule shares a lot of structural similarities with ATP synthase. Does that make sense? So you use ATP to create a gradient, and then diffusion of hydrogens directly supplies the energy for the flagellar rotation. Okay. Now, something that you should must memorize: the organization of flagella. It's a little table at the bottom of the page in the lecture notes. There are terms like monotrichus, amphitrichus, lophotrichus, and peritrichus. Just the distribution, like lophotrichus is the bunch of flagella on one end of the cell. So there's four terms, you need to know them, okay? Couple, couple more things about flagellar movement. So flagella propel cells uh, in, in two ways. It can be running and tumbling. So running is a steady movement of bacterial cells. And the question is, where do bacterial cells move? The answer is very simple. Bacterial cells move to some goal. If this goal is nutrients, 
we call this positive chemotaxis. So chemo refers to nutrients, taxis refers to movement. If the goal is to get away from, I don't know, a bad chemical, then running away will be negative chemotaxis. Some bacteria want to move towards the light, some photosynthetic bacteria, so this will be phototaxis. There are bacteria that move along the, magnet, uh, the lines of the magnetic field of Earth. This is called magnetotaxis. Does that make sense? Again, a little digression here. Many of you have taken AP1 or AP2 or both, right? Those are more conceptual subjects. I don't want to berate my lovely favorite microbiology, but a lot of stuff in microbiology will be, a lot of questions will be like, which of the following terms is described by this definition? Like what, basically, what is positive chemotaxis? Blah, 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 you pick the right answer. Make sense? A lot more of like terminology. Okay, we, we, we don't have some concepts, don't, don't get me wrong. Okay, we're good? Okay. Now, uh, next I wanted to step away from the discussion of this um, features of bacteria for a second and talk a little bit about like the whole premise of microbiology, how important microbes are. Microbes are extremely fascinating, obviously. Uh, without them, there would be piles of corpses out on the street. They, degrade them. Uh, we wouldn't have such lovely products as beer, wine, cheese, or yogurts. Okay, um, We wouldn't have a lot of drugs. I usually bring up, you know, I, you know, we like, generally like pets more than people. I think everybody agrees on that. If you have a dog and you treat your dog against the heartworm, the drug that is in, in, in the pill, the ivermectin drug, has been derived from some weird fungus found in Japan, okay? So again, bacteria, uh, microorganisms give us a lot, and it's interesting that microorganisms in the same genus can both be pretty useful and pretty bad. A good example of such genus is the genus Clostridium. I'm a master of segue. Look how I transitioned into a specific genus. Clostridia is plural. Now, what does SPP mean? SPP means species. So when I write this down, it means Clostridia species. So a uh, microorganism, which I'm not going to put the board, called Clostridium acetobutilicum, is a wonderful microorganism that can produce uh, various alcohols, like butanol, that can be used in the engines of the cars, and kind of, a lot of people look at this as the potential source of a very clean fuel for the cars, okay, that is absolutely independent of oil, okay. But there are four microorganisms from the same group that are pretty, pretty bad, and first of all, let's characterize Clostridia in general. So first of all, they are anaerobic, Gram positive, spore, well, spore I'm saying endospore forming. And this is kind of an important feature that they can form endospores. So the first microorganism uh, in, this, in this group, in this genus that I want to uh, discuss with you is Clostridium botulinum. So Clostridium botulinum is the causative agent of a condition known as botulism. This condition is characterized by flaccid paralysis. So it means that you cannot contract your muscles, and why does that happen? Now the botulinum toxin, so here's, here's a virulence factor, okay? Bacteria produces, this bacterium produces a toxin, botulinum toxin, that inhibits, now all of you who are AP1 aficionados will be excited now, inhibits the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junctions. 
So there is no transmission of a signal between the motor neuron and the muscle. Do you need to memorize this? No. Okay. So, few implications. So how do you get this, first of all? Most common by a food. Okay. Uh, improper canning practices, especially, uh, result in this. This bacterium, this bacterium forms endospores. Are you with me? Those endospores are in the environment. It's normal. People can, I don't know, vegetables. They don't wash them properly. They don't sterilize them properly. So endospores end up in the can. Okay? It's perfect anaerobic environment. A bunch of nutrients. Endospores germinate. Microorganism reproduces. Eventually dies. But while it reproduces, it releases a lot of toxin. People open the can, start eating. Eat the toxin, usually die. Also, can be transmitted via wounds. Uh, important feature, you get sick. Look, you get sick not because of bacteria replicating, because of cons consumption of toxin. Antibiotics don't help, okay? How poisonous the toxin, how toxic the toxin is. The amount of toxin that you could stuff into that coffee mug would be sufficient to kill the entire population of Earth several times over. It is the most toxic substance known to humans. Um, that makes sense? Another lovely microorganism from the same genus is Clostridium tetanus. And if you guess the disease, you guessed it right. The disease is tetanus also known as lockjaw, um, and it's spastic paralysis. So the mechanism is fairly simple. Another toxin called titanospasmin inhibits inhibitory neurons. When you inhibit inhibition, that's basically activation. All your muscles go into uh, continuous contraction, right? This is why we call this disease a log jaw. Um, green on the face, clenched fists, bent elbows, bent back, okay? Spastic paralysis of all the muscles, including diaphragm, by the way, which sucks. Um, so how do you get tetanus? All, I believe, familiar usually via wounds. This illustrates that both uh, Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium, not tetany, I'm sorry, it's tetany. Uh, Clostridium tetany and Clostridium botulinum are both environmental bacteria, okay? Um, there was a case in the Washington state a couple of years ago. A boy acquired, of course, of course, and vaccinated boy acquired Clostridium tetany, um, spent six months in a hospital, was totally cured, final hospital bill was $840,000, or $410,000, or $810,000, like that ballpark, a little bit short of a million. Uh, the good thing, there's a vaccine, component of DTaP, which is really effective, okay? So, vaccinate. And Here's another trouble with tetanus. By the time you develop tetanus, the microorganism is pretty much gone. Okay, so antibiotics, again, have no effect here. Third one, Clostridium difficile. No, 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 not difficile, wait a minute. We forgot about perfringens. Clostridium perfringens, causative agent of gas gangrene. Now, this lovely fella produces a whole bunch of various enzymes that basically destroy the tissue. Now, first of all, I mentioned spore forming found in the environment, right? So people with wounds on their feet, walk around, bare feet, get those spores inside into the tissue. And those people have diabetes, their peripheral circulation is pretty poor, so this anaerobic microorganism is thriving in hypoxic tissue. That makes sense? This tissue, well, you know, kind of disassembles slowly. The only treatment really um, 
bariatric chamber can be high hyperbaric, sorry, hyperbaric chamber, uh, high oxygen pressure, you know, you can do that. Um, antibiotics don't really work, so debridement, amputation, um, yeah, it's kind of only options, okay? And the one that I almost canceled, Clostridium difficile. So formally, Clostridium difficile causes ulcerative colitis, more known as C. diff. Okay. So uh, here's what happens. This microorganism, again, anaerobic spore forming, right? So spores are sitting in a hospital environment, so it's a nosocomial pathogen, hospital acquired pathogen. Nosocomial means hospital acquired. So people in the hospital, <coughs> they're usually sick. Uh, the spores get into the digestive tract where they can germinate. But the thing is, in the gut of a healthy person, uh, there's a, only 1,500 known species of microorganisms. And God knows how many unknown species, OK? And they establish a really dogged dog environment, very competitive environment. So Clostridium does not have a chance to successfully compete for the resources, basically being chipped, being controlled by the normal microbiome. That makes sense? There are studies showing that uh, you can isolate Clostridium difficile from healthy people. Okay? Then people in the hospital may end up being on antibiotics. Okay? Those antibiotics. Uh, do a damage to gut microbiome. So far we good. And suddenly the competition drops. And that results in what's called super infection. When suddenly Clostridium difficile wins the race and becomes the dominant species in the gut, releases a whole bunch of uh, enzymes and toxins that cause inflammation and lesions on the uh, gut epithelium can result in peritonitis and ultimately in death, okay? So um, the older approach to treatment was to treat it with antibiotics, which is kind of funny if you think about it. So we do antibiotics, it causes the disease, which is blasted with antibiotics. Like, you know, um, taking care of forest fire by dropping an atomic bomb oil. Uh, now, um, the current approach is much more Elegant, I think. It's a fecal transplant. So um, clinics will collect feces from donors. Cleveland Clinic accepts fecal donors, even pays money. Uh, I think 40 bucks per donation. And they will determine, well, they first will determine if your poop works, if it's like healthy and stuff. And then it is freeze-dried, packaged into little pills. People swallow it, but come on, it's, it's like a vitamin. It used to be much worse. It used to be just a fecal suspension that people drank. Aside from, aside from the taste issues, the main problem is that it has to come through the stomach, which is not good for intestinal microbes. Then they switch to enema, which kind of, you know, represents a little bit of a logistical delivery problem, right? Uh, so they ended up with freeze-dried samples which works pretty good. And there are multiple studies showing that fecal transplants work nice. OK? Any questions? OK. Um, now, when we talk about bacteria, we're usually not thinking, well, we can't think CDF. But let's admit, the most, the most telling, the most common, the most sort of poster child of bacteria is Staphylococci. OK, we think Staph aureus. Come on. Everybody knows stuff for is. So, Staphylococci species, we're going to talk about three of them. So, again, can we characterize? Well, it's going to be a gram positive again. Uh, I'm not going to throw at you the type of metabolism formally. Staphylococci are facultatively anaerobic. You may not know what it is. So, Consider this, they can grow in the presence of oxygen just fine. Can they grow without oxygen? Yep. They, they, they can use it, they don't need to. So three species that I wanted to focus your attention on.
first is Staphylococcus epidermidis. It's the common component of the skin microbiome. Okay. So it is not considered to be a pathogen. We good? Of course, if you take an extremely immunocompromised patient, this microorganism can cause disease, right? Then we have Staphylococcus. It's not the only three existing Staphylococcus species. Staphylococcus saprophyticus. One of the pretty important causes of urinary tract infection. Okay? And finally, we have the celebrity here, Staphylococcus aureus. Okay? So this microorganism, first of all, I want to highlight for many, many organisms. You can run into the situation when a person, so like we consider this a pathogen, right? Right? So you now are looking at a person who has Staph aureus colonization in the nose. I have Staph aureus in my, I, I've been isolating it for years. I'm fine. I don't have sinusitis, I don't have rhinitis, I don't have like various complications. It's a normal resident colonizer of my nose. Does everybody have it? No. Some, about 15 to 20 percent of population have Staph aureus in the nasal or nasal cavity or in the uh, pharynx. That makes sense? So, it's not always a pathogen, but it can be. So we're going to start with the skin conditions. So what can Staphylococcus aureus do to your skin? We're going to start with impetigo. Um, some of you may have had it. Many of you may have heard about it. It's the superficial skin condition that looks like a rash, looks really ugly, doesn't really bother much. Very, very transmissible, very treatable. Okay. Now, in newborns, skin infection with Staphylococcus aureus can result in scalded skin syndrome. Now, here's an interesting story on how it happens. So again, if you remember your um, MP1 integumentary system, you have epithelium, which is epidermis, okay? Then you have basement membrane, And then you have pretty thick layer of dermis. So Staphylococcus aureus produces so-called exfoliating toxin. Okay, and this exfoliating toxin destroys the basement membrane. Are you with me? So now, nothing holds epithelium, the epidermis, and dermis together. And epidermis starts to fall off to exfoliate. So babies look like they were bathed in a boiled water. Boiling water, not boiled, boiling water. Does that make sense? Looks pretty scary, very treatable. A um, couple thousand babies develop this condition in the hospitals every year. They treat it, they're fine. Okay? Now, what if uh, this microorganism ends up in the hair follicle. In the hair follicle, it causes furuncles and carbuncles. So furuncle is the infection of a single hair follicle, carbuncle is the infection of multiple, treated usually surgically, not just opened up and drained, you know. Okay, now, if Staphorius penetrates deeper, and ends up in a subcutaneous tissue that results in a cellulitis. You can see that I am going from the superficial infection into deeper and deeper in the tissue, right? So cellulitis, redness, tenderness, warmth, a certain part of the face or body, usually face. Now the culmination of it all, which usually happens in people who are severely immunocompromised, will be the condition known as necrotizing fasciitis. At this point, honestly, we left the skin like 
days ago. It's not skin anymore. It's beyond the subcutaneous tissue. We're talking about muscles. So necrotizing fasciitis or flesh-eating bacteria. Uh, microorganism releases a whole bunch of toxins and enzymes that destroy the structure of the connective tissue and basically Issue falls apart. Okay, we're good. Understood. Flesh-eating bacteria. The only treatment is like debridement or amputation. Now that's <coughs> that's skin. Okay, respiratory system. Uh, sinusitis. In mild cases, can be rhinitis. Can progress to pneumonia. Now, I don't know if you know, but. In uh, coronavirus patients that were kind of moved from ICU after you know mechanical ventilation or something into the regular ward, staphylococcal pneumonia is one of the most common complications. Again, if you think about it, in a healthy person, not really. In a person that's been sick and immunosuppressed and like really frail, sure. Does that make sense? Good. Um, so cardiovascular, in cardiovascular system, staph aureus can cause endocarditis, infection of the cardiac valves. Uh, what else do we have? Um, yeah, renal system, well, UTIs. Now let's let's do blood. It's not really blood, but it's going to be toxic shock syndrome. So the toxin called toxic shock syndrome toxin or TSST uh, overactivates the immune system. Now, you probably have heard um, about that condition stemming from use of contaminated uh, female hygienic products with tampons in 1972, I believe it happened. Um, the microorganism enters the bloodstream, activates about 20% of all T cells, massive inflammation, shock, death. Does that make sense? Questions on the staphylococcal. Oh, yeah, transmission. How do you transmit it? Respiratory contact. That's kind of pretty obvious. Okay, good. Questions about staphylococcus? 